American Express is proud to join 13 in celebrating the historic heritage and cultural diversity of Staten Island. Historic preservation has long been the hallmark of American Express's involvement in the community. We are proud to support a walk around Staten Island, a chance to discover and experience Staten Island's unique history and culture. And by Richmond University Medical Center. Richmond University Medical Center on Staten Island's North Shore is proud to sponsor a walk around Staten Island. Offering the highest quality of care, RUMC serves the medical needs of our growing community. Richmond University Medical Center, working harder to serve you better. And by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. I'll take Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island, too. <laughs> no, don't quit the pay job. All right, I had you know what I was thinking. Yeah, thanks a lot. Anyway, Barry and I didn't take to the other boroughs, but we did walk on Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, Manhattan, and now in this lovely free 25-minute ferry ride, we're finally heading out to Staten Island. Staten Island, least populated of all the boroughs, just shy of 500,000 people. It's the most rural borough, the most remote. It's got the highest percentage of Italians of any of the New York boroughs and the highest percentage of Republican voters, even though a lot of them are registered Democrats. Go figure. But well, something else Staten Island had was Cornelius Vanderbilt. The Vanderbilt of the Vanderbilts in the early 19th century. He makes his money on the Staten Island Ferry. Later on in the 19th century, invest that money in the New York Central Railroad and will build Grand Central Terminal. So every time you're in Grand Central, just remember the money for that place, it was made on the boat we're on now. Staten Island, Henry Hudson, on September 11th, 1609, what a coincidence, sailed into what is now New York Harbor for the Dutch. Uh, the Dutch named this island Staten Eiland, which is Dutch for Parliament in the Netherlands. If you look at a map of Staten Island, it's about 14 miles tall and about seven miles wide. The New York Marathon starts here on the island. The runners run across the Verrazano Narrows Bridge into Brooklyn. The people of the island are really proud and they're independent, even to the point of, at one point, trying to secede from New York City. How surprising is that? Well, you know, David, it's a compact little island, and of course, being an island, it's surrounded by water, so that makes it insular. On the north side is the Kill Van Cull between it and Bayonne. On the west side, Arthur Kill between it and New Jersey, by the way. Kill is a Dutch word for stream or river. It has nothing to do with the Sopranos. And on the east side of the island, below the Verrazano Bridge, it's what Staten Island is called the South Shore, faces lower New York Bay. And the island itself, by the way, the most interesting topographical feature is the backbone of hills that runs from St. George deep into the center of the island. Staten Island is part of the terminal moraine, which runs through Brooklyn and Queens. It includes Tote Hill, which is the tallest spot on the east coast below Mount Desert Island, uh, 410 feet. I'm right. getting vertigo. Staten Island, by the way, has some beautiful Victorian neighborhoods stretching on the North Shore from St. George West to New Brighton, West Brighton, uh, Port Richmond, and then on the east and south shores, just follow the Staten Island Rapid Transit, Stapleton, Rosebank, where the Alice Austin House is, all the way down to Tottenville. People can't believe how beautiful some of those houses are, as well as hilltop communities back in the 19th century. Wealthy New Yorkers, wealthy Southerners, because they did so much business with us, built their houses there in the hills. Those hilltop communities are actually built on the, the backbone of the island, which is serpentine. Serpentine? Kryptonite? <laughs> Sounds yeah. like that, right? Well, it's green. Yeah, it is. And actually, that's the same rock we saw in Hoboken. Yeah. And as Barry said earlier, there is so much to do here. There's the Staten Island Museum. It is a wonderful museum. Some 65,000 adults and children go through it each year. It's arts and natural sciences. Much of the lighthouse technology of the last 150 years was accomplished here, so eventually they're going to build a maritime museum. And in back of us is Borough Hall, 1906. With a mansard roof. Hey, David. How am I doing, Teach? I'm impressed. I really Thank am you so impressed. Much. Thank you. Carrier and Hastings, who did our New York Public Library, did this in 1906. The interior was recently restored in the late 1990s. You have these murals inside from the WPA era of 1940. Frederick Starr did a series of historical murals. Do you know, 
I've got three quarters of those murals are sites we're going to visit. Just up the street from us is the 1929 St. George Movie Palace, 2,800 seats. You know those great movie palaces, that kind of over-the-top style that just knocks your eyes out. 1972, by that time, the movie palaces were out. It closes up. Rosemary Capazzalo and her daughters in 2004 form a nonprofit organization. They have done a remarkable job of restoring that interior. Finally, the St. George area of Staten Island. Staten Island itself has a wonderful venue for all kinds of live entertainment. First stop is Snug Harbor, and this is the first of our Staten Island surprises. More than 25 buildings in a stunning architectural complex. What is this? Don't you feel like you're on the top of the Acropolis with these great Greek Revival temples in front of us? Well, where are we? We were just at St. George where the ferry lands. Now we're just a little ways down the north shore of Staten Island at Snug Harbor. And this is a story that goes back to 1801. Captain Robert Richard Randall dies in that year. He leaves in his will his land in what is now Greenwich Village and money for the founding of a home for retired merchant seamen. Captain Randall understood it was hard getting old when you're a merchant seaman. You know, you're all alone and you drink and all that. So he leaves his money in his land. His family fights the will for 30 years. Uh, boy, that's an old story. Finally, the fight is settled in the early 1830s. By that time, Captain Randall's property in Greenwich Village is worth a fortune for luxury townhouses, which they build and is still there on the north side of Washington Square. The trustees of what they call Sailor Snug Harbor buy this property, much cheaper land on the north shore of Staten Island. How much is here? 83 acres. And they build these buildings we see, and by the early 1830s, the sailors start to show up. You know, by the early 1900s, there were a thousand retired sailors living here. What was this place like with a thousand sailors in the same territory? I think today we'd make a reality show out of it <laughs> because you had the sailors and you could imagine those, those hard scrabble salty dogs and they were lorded over by these prissy trustees. Very respectable, and they were appalled by the behavior of the sailors. Well, I should hope so. Oh, God, oh. They, had, they had regulations this long, and the sailors said a few things to them that I can't say because we're on family television. Well, everything changes. When Social Security came in in the 1930s, in a sense, Sailor's Snug Harbor was no longer needed. By the 1970s, the sailors are out of here. And in 1976, this becomes the Snug Harbor Cultural Center. Today, it shares the land with several other independent cultural organizations. And in fact, we're going to see one of those right now. Here on the Snug Harbor grounds, there are other independent cultural institutions like the Noble Maritime Collection, which has an entire houseboat inside the building. Mm -hmm. There's the Staten Island Children's Museum, which locals say is wonderful yes. for the kids. Very good. Too. Yes. And then there's the Staten Island Botanical Gardens, beautiful in themselves, but as part of the gardens, there is the Chinese Scholars Garden, which we're in right now. It's the only one of its kind in the United States. This alone is worth the trip to Snug Harbor and Staten Island. What an amazing place. This was built in 1998, designed by one of the leading garden designers from China. Forty artisans and craftsmen came over from Zhuzhou, which is a city west of Shanghai, to do this garden. And they lived here on the grounds while they built the garden with prefabricated architectural elements made in Zhuzhou. The Chinese garden goes back almost 2,000, more than 2,000 years, but it really came into its own in the Ming Dynasty, about 14th to 17th century in our calendar. These gardens were built by scholars who, in the Confucian system, were high up in the court. They were basically court officials under a lot of pressure. One thing wrong, off with your head. So when they retired, they would retire to a house, and we are actually within a house in which part of the garden is an extension of the house, beyond the house, other parts of the garden for walking, contemplating. In a Chinese garden, there's always a sense of variety, there's always a sense of surprise, there's always a sense of mystery. 
It's fascinating. There's a garden like this in the old city of Shanghai, much bigger, of course, but extraordinary how much this resembles gardens in China. Now, sometimes the scholar would take off his shoes and walk barefoot through the garden to feel underfoot all the so different... Right. Yeah. Yes, you're right. He would also get a relaxing massage. We need this kind of thing in the 21st century. Isn't it amazing what you find on the grounds of Snug Harbor? Harbor, Richmond County Bank Stadium, and it's a minor league baseball team, a farm club of the New York Yankees. They call them the Baby Bombers. It's the Staten Island Yankees. Well, I saw the real Yankees when I was eight years old. You did? That's right. And it was my one and only baseball game. You mean this is number two? That's right. And I, I am honored. I, I am honored. I to remember the Franks. I remember. You mean the hot dog? Yeah. The Franks. The, okay. The hot dog. Actually, my father was a baseball nut. Yeah. He had the baseball game on the radio in the car all the time. Okay. And you know something? I totally zoned it out. I don't <laughs> even remember what he who he rooted for. Here's another base hit for the Yankees. Oh, they're getting to this yeah, pitcher. They they're getting to this pitcher early. Oh, it's only the second inning. Before the term photojournalist was even coined, there was a great photojournalist here on Staten Island, spent her whole life here. Yes, her. And her name was Alice Austin, and she was awesome. She was different. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Alice Austin is born in 1866 to a very comfortable family here on Staten Island. Her grandfather, back in 1844, bought this house. It was a 1690s Dutch farmhouse. He turns it into a beautiful, picturesque Gothic Revival cottage, perfect for the site we're in, and what a site it is here on Upper New York Bay. My goodness, coming out of this house every day with this view. Mm. Well, Alice's mother marries and has Alice, but the father abandons them almost immediately. So the mother moves back with her own father, and Alice is brought up in this house, clear comfort. With her grandfathers. Yes, and she was the only child in a house of adults, and they adored her. Right. We're here, David, here at the Alice Austin House, just uh, north of the Verrazano Bridge, just down the coast of Staten Island from Saint, the St. Saint George Ferry Terminal. And this is the Rosebank section of Staten Island. And by the way, clear comfort is not the only thing interesting in Rosebank. Right nearby is the Garibaldi Mucci Museum, Antonio Mucci was an inventor who might have invented the telephone, it's possible. And his guest, Giuseppe Garibaldi, oh, he's the George Washington of a modern unified Italy. He lives here in exile before he goes back to Italy in 1854 and gets the whole country together. Yeah. Around the corner from that, by the way, is a wonderful little grotto, an outdoor grotto. Uh, it's Our Lady of Carmel Grotto, built in the 1930s by a grieving Italian father who had just lost his five-year-old son. And I've seen grottos like that in Italy. I never would expect one here in New York City. Coming back to Alice yeah, Austin. Mm. Here she is at 22 years old. Right, and look at her. Wasn't she gorgeous? <laughs> and that dress, it tells us so much about the age she grew up in. She was Part a respect the society, you know, respectable young her, lady, right. but she was a respectable young lady with a difference. Right. She had a love for photography family supported her and everywhere she went she went with her camera there's a picture of clear comfort back in the 19th century when she knew it when she went with her friends on picnics sailing this is a wonderful photograph you know they they think that during her lifetime she produced 9,000 photos and there's about 3,500 of them still left and here, lower Manhattan East the side. other island she loved besides Staten Island was Manhattan Island and when she went to the city she was interested in the life of the city. This is not the kind of thing photographers took back then. No. Everything but that's the photojournalist aspect. And also that her work reflects a period. 
Yes. Right? Yes. And you know, That's 50 years later, see. there's another photojournalist who does the same thing. Her name is Bernice Abbott. That's you right. spoke about her in the village exactly. video. And here is a wonderful photograph of her maid and the dog on the steps of Clear Comfort right over there. With You notice there's a sailboat in the background. An extraordinary, extraordinary career. Now, she spends her adult life with her love photography, but by the 1920s, the family fortune is dwindling. 1929 stock market crash, she loses everything. By 1945, she's impoverished, she loses the house. Her photographs, the plates, the photographs are taken over by the Staten Island Historical Society, but Alice herself had to go into the poorhouse of Staten Island up on the hill next to Sea View Tuberculosis Hospital. Oh, tragic. Sad. Tragic. But in 1951, Staten Island Historical Society mounts an exhibit she becomes known, and from the money that she was able to make through that exhibit, she was able to leave the poorhouse and get into a nursing home and spend the last year of her life in comfort. She dies in 1952. An amazing lady, what I love about her, a very complicated person. She was brought up to be a fine, genteel young lady of the upper class, but she never married. She never had a Victorian husband to say, Alice, come out of the dark room and make me dinner. Not Alice. Also a fabulous athlete. She's a great tennis player. Yes. In, in and rode her bike in the New York. And she, this was an age when women were finally being allowed to do that kind of thing. Alice was in the forefront of it all. Here we are in the middle of Fort Wadsworth at Water's Edge, looking to New York Harbor with this magnificent view of Brooklyn, of Manhattan, Jersey City, Statue of Liberty. But more than that, we're standing in one of the most significant historical spots in America, when you think militarily. Well, and also in terms of economy, in terms of history, we're at the Narrows. The Narrows are like a pincer that, that pinches New York Harbor in two. The lower harbor facing the, the ocean, the upper harbor facing the city. That means that all the squalls of the Atlantic were kept out in the Atlantic, and that made New York Harbor safe for commerce, for trade. It's why New York became the great city it became. And strategically, it's said that whoever controls this ground controls New York City. That's right. And didn't they all know it from the American Indians? Started, yeah, with the Native Americans, then the Dutch, then the English, then the Americans, and again, you know, the Brits, and then finally the Americans again. Absolutely, historically, right on through. But what's the history of this Well, place? actually, the Americans finally got serious about fortifications here in anticipation of the War of 1812. Remember, New York was occupied during the Revolution. We did not want the British back for the War of 1812. We built Castle Clinton over in the Battery, Castle Williams in Governor's Island, and the two forts here, uh, that was Fort Richmond, which is now Fort Wadsworth, and Fort Hamilton across from Brooklyn. Well, the British stayed out of New York. They went to Washington, and they burned Washington. Now, of course, people get a little confused. The whole area is Fort Wadsworth. We're in Battery Weed. Uh, up above us is Fort Tompkins, which actually was built to protect Battery Weed. Basically, the fortifications we see right now date from the 1840s and 50s, designed, by the way, by Joseph Totten for whom Fort Totten is named in Queens, this is an amazing piece of work, so minimalist and so modern. It's all granite, it's a battery with three tiers of casemates, that's the alcoves for the cannon. And when this was in operation, more than 100 cannon could bomb to smithereens anything coming through the net. And it's only a mile over to Brooklyn which well, is not far when it comes to Kansas. Between Fort Hamilton and, and what is now Fort Wadsworth, you could smash anything out of the water. It's, you mentioned Robert E. Lee. When he was a younger officer, he was involved in, uh, in making decisions about these fortifications. So 20 years later, in the Civil War, the Confederacy did have some ships sitting out at Sandy Hook. Did they come through the harbor? No. Lee knew. Don't even take a chance. He knew better. Well, it's interesting how fast technology changes. By the second half of the 19th century, actually, the military technology has advanced so much that this was obsolete in terms of military defense. But it maintained a military function right through the 1960s. You know, up until 1966, this was the control center for the Nike defense missile system for New York City. Right. And in 1994, when the base closed, it was the longest continuously habited military base in the United States. Well, thank goodness they gave it to the National Park Service. It's one of the most exquisite parks in the Gateway Recreational Area. And today, on the heights especially, 
the most magnificent views of New York Harbor, but since 1964, one of the greatest views from here is of this spectacular bridge, the Verrazano. We'll return to a walk around Staten Island with David Hartman and historian Barry Lewis after this short break. Hi, I'm Tom Stewart, and all of us here at 13 are proud to bring you David Hartman and Barry Lewis, another of their terrific walking tours. And we're particularly excited to take you to Staten Island a part of New York that does seem just a bit unfamiliar to a lot of us. And we're hoping that 13's friends and neighbors living on Staten Island are ready to make their call to us at 1-800-272-1313 to cheer for their home borough. And if you're not from Staten Island, we hope you'll make a call anyway for more walks in the future, like this one around Staten Island. So please, let's get these phones ringing right now. Hello, I'm Kathy Ryan here with historian Barry Lewis and with Camilla Hanks, the executive director of the Downtown Staten Island Council. But before we hear from them, let's go back to Tom, who has great news to get this walking tour off on the right foot. Thanks a lot, Kathy. We are delighted to welcome Tim McClyman to our studio here at 13. Tim is the president of the American Express Foundation, and he brings with him a $5,000 challenge grant as an incentive for you to support 13. So Tim, tell the folks at home what this challenge grant means and how it's supposed to work. Well, Tom, it's very simple. During tonight's program, uh, the American Express Foundation will match on a dollar for dollar basis any viewer's contribution to the station up to $5,000. Thank you for that very generous offer. What that You're really welcome. means is it really doubles the amount of your contribution to 13 right now. Now, tell us about the American Express Foundation's commitment to the world of the nonprofit organization and specifically 13. Well, the American Express Foundation is one of the sponsors of tonight's program, uh, A Walk Around Staten Island. And it's part of our uh, support of historic preservation, which we do around the world uh, in helping to preserve monuments and historic buildings in many, many communities. I understand you had something to do with a certain statue in the harbor. We did. Uh, we did. We helped restore the Statue of Liberty back in the 1980s, and that's really how we got started uh, supporting historic that's preservation. Terrific. Now, I know that you personally also are a big fan of what we do here at 13. Tell I me am. about it. I am. Well, I like to watch a lot of programs uh, here on Channel 13. Uh, American Masters is one of my favorites because I like in-depth interviews of people like Bob Dylan and, and Willie Nelson. Right. I uh, also like uh, great performances and when my daughter was smaller we watched Sesame Street all the Excellent, time. excellent. So you're a true believer we and are. can thus talk directly to our audience and tell them why it's so important for them to make a call to us right now. Well tonight if you make a contribution to Channel 13 American Express Foundation will match your contribution on a dollar for dollar basis up to five thousand dollars and we encourage you to do that uh, and call the station right now. Thanks so much, Tim, and thanks also to the American Express Foundation for making this generous grant. So right now, take up the American Express Foundation challenge. Do it right now. Call us at 1-800-272-1313 or go online to 13.org and make the best contribution you can. Show your support for 13 and know that whatever amount you contribute will be matched dollar for dollar by our friends at the American Express Foundation. And now let's go back to Kathy and Barry Lewis. Thanks, Tom, and a warm welcome to Barry Lewis, our intrepid guide, who along with David Hartman has walked us up, down, around, and across our community during the past several years. And with us, too, is Camilla Hanks, a real powerhouse of love for Staten Island. Welcome to both of you. you. Now, I have to be honest, when I told people that the, the, the walking tour this it's the 11th show, isn't it? It's been 11 years? Yes, that's right. It is the 11th uh, That is, and because you are beloved, Barry. I, I said it's going to be Staten Island, and they said, oh, Staten Island's not a borough. Come on. <laughs> what do you say to those people, Camilla? Oh, that's absolutely insane. I mean, I'm a, a native islander, and I love living on Staten Island, and it's a wonderful place to discover, you know, new things, and it's just wonderful to live. Well, you have helped us discover many things in this show. The hills, the beaches, the hiking, the beauty, the cultural depth and diversity. It's a great show. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Now, now we have to thank James. James Nicoloro is now a producer, and he did a great job, didn't he? Yes. I mean, he had good material to work with. Yes, and our viewers did a great job because they've been supporting you for a long time, and we sure need more of that tonight. So let's hear more from Tom Stewart with the wonderful list of gifts you'll receive along with our thanks when you support 13. 
Thanks again, Kathy. Of course, we welcome any amount you'd like to offer. But when you contribute $60, we'll thank you with Thomas Mateo's wonderful book, simply called Staten Island, New York. In less than 100 pages, you'll find the complete story of Staten Island, from its discovery in 1524 right up to the present. You'll also get a sense of the famous writers who've called this island of beautiful harbors and beaches and farms and hunting grounds their personal inspiration. We're talking about the likes of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Henry David Thoreau, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. We also learn that Staten Island has been a land of opportunity for entrepreneurs with names like Vanderbilt, Trump, and Goodyear. And it's been a haven for the likes of Garibaldi, Santa Ana, and Maxim Gorky. Mateo's book chronicles Staten Island's 400 years of history and dramatic change that make it the fastest growing county in New York State. Now when you make a contribution of $75, we'll send you the DVD of this latest walking tour that explores the history and cultural treasures of Staten Island, from the Beaux-Arts Borough Hall to a lavish Greek revival mansion and the near ruin of a most unusual hospital. When you contribute $150, we'll say thanks by sending you the Walk Around Staten Island DVD, Thomas Mateo's book, and your very own 13 umbrella. And finally, when you support 13 with a generous contribution of $350, we'll send you an entire collection of walking tours, eight of them in all. Let Barry and David take you through Harlem, Central Park, up Broadway, through Greenwich Village, around Brooklyn, through the Bronx and Queens, and finally, around Staten Island. So please, pick the thank you gift of your choice and then call us at 1-800-272-1313. Or go online to 13.org with your contribution. And remember, too, that American Express has promised to match your contribution dollar for dollar until we've reached $5,000 in viewer support. And, of course, you can charge your contribution if you like. Just be sure to have your credit card with you when you make your call. Now let's hear more from Kathy and Barry and Camilla Hanks. Thanks, Tom. Again, the number is 1-800-272-1313. Or if you're online, go to our safe and secure website at 13.org. Barry, of course, is our favorite guide to the sights of New York City. And Camilla is a lifetime Staten Islander and currently executive director of the Downtown Staten Island Council. And you can welcome them both by making your call to 13 right now, especially when American Express is offering such a generous challenge, a matching grant this is the time to give money now to 13 because we need to have more of these tours and the only way we're going to do it is we have more money and that's that's the bottom line and it's a wonderful and very enjoyable way for us to learn about our community the greater new york area there was so much i didn't know about staten island until i sat down and watched this show that's the great thing about new york city and it shows you that I mean, Camilla knows this. Mm -hmm. Staten Island is so much of the year. I lived in St. George mm -hmm. for three months back in 1970. I had a sublet, and I wandered Staten Island. Here it is 37 years later. Mm -hmm. And do you know there are parts of Staten Island that have not changed since I lived there? There's plenty that has changed. Yes. But parts have not changed. The Alice Austin House, I mm -hmm. first went there. That back was a in beautiful segment. Isn't it wonderful? It was very moving. She needs to be known. Yes. And if we can do anything to put Alice Austin in the public eye, then I'm a happy boy because well, she's you, a fascinating lady. You went some way to do that. I mean, the trajectory of her life and, and the way you cut, and her eye in the photography that you showed, it was really yeah. moving. I, I don't understand why people don't know her name. She should be as famous as Bernice Abbott, who's an excellent photographer, but well known. Yeah. And Alice Austin, I, uh, people draw a blank, and how could they? She gave us a record of New York in the late 19th century, not just the wealthy of Staten Island, but the street scene she did in Manhattan, she had a photojournalist eye that belongs to the 20th century, excuse me, the 21st. I agree, <laughs> absolutely. And if you agree, please call now and pledge. Help us celebrate the borough of Staten Island by making a contribution to 13. And thank you for making a contribution that helps us meet the challenges we face every day. If you prefer, mail your check to 13, Box 1313, New York, New York, 10101. Major funding for a walk around Staten Island is made possible by Richmond County Savings Foundation and American Express. From a distance, the bridge is exciting to see and beautiful and all that. 
but when you get down under it, it's overwhelming. It's magnificent. Isn't it a beautiful piece of construction? The man who designed this, Othmarman, nobody knows his name today, but he was one of the brilliant bridge designers of the 20th century. His first great work was the 1931 George Washington Bridge. That's still considered one of the most beautiful bridges in the world. His last great work was the Verrazano Narrows, which is right in back of us. In between, he did the Bronx Whitestone Bridge, beautiful bridge. He did the three bridges that connect Staten Island with the mainland. That would be the Outer Bridge Crossing, the Gothels Bridge, and the Bayonne. We just drove under the Bayonne, so beautiful. Well, in 1964, when the Verrazano opened, of course, we always call it the Verrazano. We never use all those syllables. And it's interesting, it was named for Giovanni da Verrazano, who was the first European to sail into the harbor back in 1524. And by the way, his name has two Z's in it. That's right. But when they built the bridge, they made a typo. And so poor Verrazano is immortalized with only one Z. When this bridge opened in 1964, Mr. Amman was 85 years old, which means he designed this in his 80s. Amazing. Amazing, right? I remember when I came back from Europe after two years being in Paris, and it was 1965, I sailed on the Queen Mary One in the last year of its operation, and we came in at dawn underneath the new Verrazano Bridge past the Statue of Liberty. It was one of the most thrilling events. Well. When this bridge opened, needless to say, it completely changed Staten Island. We're really lucky, because we have a young woman with us who writes for the New York Times. As importantly as that is, she's a native Staten Islander, and she is Maureen Seberg, and we're glad to have you with us. Gentlemen, thanks for coming out to see us. Well Hello. done. Uh, BB and AB, which I've heard <laughs> being out here in Staten Island, tell us what that means. Well, before the bridge, it was somewhat agricultural. Uh, there were still working farms. It was uh, bucolic and lovely in its way, but not very much a part of the city, not so much a part of the world, perhaps a little isolated. Then the bridge opened in 1964, and, and with it, the world arrived on our doorstep. So what happened here in Staten Island as a result of the bridge, people being able just to drive over here? Oh, what happened is with uh, John F. Kennedy Airport being the Ellis Island of my generation, uh, this became a gateway uh, to America, and many people first settled here. So what happened with the population? It, it exploded. It exploded. We went from an agrarian society to uh, somewhat suburban and uh, metropolitan. To what extent did the Italian population increase as a result of the bridge being here? It increased markedly, uh, many of them coming from Brooklyn and the other boroughs. Uh, we're now, I believe, at 37.4% Italian people, so it continues to grow even now. But what's happening is, with the greatest, uh, the second greatest wave of immigration since the turn of the century happening as we speak, it's not just European folks anymore, it's everyone. What are some of these other ethnic groups that have moved in? Well, a couple of the really interesting ones, because I consider them perhaps not greatest in number, but world class in, in the sense that they are their nation's largest diasporas in America living here, are the Sri Lankans and the Liberians. In fact, two Sri Lankans, they just call Staten Island America. This is what they know. They call it America. And I've started to call it Little Lanka <laughs> because there's so many of them. <laughs> which is terrific. Go back to when the bridge was built. Your parents were both from Staten Island? No, uh, my father is a native Staten Islander from Castleton Corners, and my mom's an Irish gal from Astoria. And I like to think that without that bridge, I wouldn't be standing here with you today because I don't think she could have continued dating him uh, uh, were it not for the convenience. One of their first dates was to drive across it on opening day. So they were in favor of the bridge. Absolutely. <laughs> I wonder how many of the some 19 million people that live in metropolitan New York know that there is not only a beautiful sand beach here, but you can really swim in the water. It's probably why the first European settlers settled here on South Beach, just north of where we are back in 1661. They set up a little settlement at the foot of Ocean Avenue, which is just south of Fort Wadsworth, uh, built themselves a little village called Uddorp, 
eventually. Dutch. Dutch for Old Town. And by the way, their leader, Pierre Bilieu, he built his farmhouse up on what is now Richmond Road in the Dungan Hill section of Staten Island. That house is still here. Some people know it as the Perrine House. It's one of the oldest houses now in New York City. Now, Uddorp flourishes, and then the English take over in 1664. They take over all of New Netherlands, including New Amsterdam, which is, of course, now New York, Staten Island as well. They extend the settlement southward. They built a new part of town, and they call it New Dorp. Maybe their buildings aren't here anymore, but New Dorp is still one of the fine communities here on the east coast of Staten Island. Interestingly, by the 1690s, the Dorps lose out to Richmond Town, which we're going to see towards the end of the walk, which becomes the great 18th century center of Staten Island life. Now, this South Beach that we're on, this beautiful beach, this was a quiet backwater beach of a rural farming county until the 1880s, and then ferry service was set up from New York, where there already were a million people, and Brooklyn, which was the fourth largest city in the state. Just like whenever you establish transportation, stuff happened. And people came over here in droves. By the 1890s, South Beach rivals Coney Island as an amusement center, shooting galleries, dance halls, beer halls, Ferris wheels. And by 1906, South Beach got its own version of a Coney Island amusement park. It was called Happy Land. Hello, Happy Land. <laughs> but Coney Island lasted for yes, decades. Yes, it did. Happy Land burned down in 1917, was never replaced. And yeah. there was a reason for that, because the waters that everyone came here to swim in by that time were getting too polluted. As a matter of fact, in 1917, the city forbade swimming here at South Beach. That's how bad the water was. Needless to say, South Beach goes down the tubes. By 1935, under the WPA program, same era, same program that created Orchard Beach in the Bronx, the city takes over all of South Beach, rips out the derelict old buildings, builds this beautiful boardwalk, calls it the FDR for the president. It's one of the longest boardwalks here in North America. Of course, it doesn't beat out Atlantic City, but it's very close to the Rockaway boardwalk, which we saw in the Queen's Walk. What is Great Kills Harbor? Well, that's interesting. Today, it's a wild, rustic park. People think it was that way forever. Not really. It used to be landfill, which is a nice way of saying a garbage dump. 1949, the city transformed that garbage dump into that beautiful park we know today. It's not only people that enjoy that park. If you know anything about the monarch butterfly. Tell me. Well, they use it as a motel on their way south to their winter home in Mexico. I say, you, you spend summer in the north, you spend winter in Mexico. It's not bad being a monarch butterfly. You know, you hear about a place and then figure, well, you know, how good can it be? Danino's? Oh, this is good. Is this fabulous? Great. Well, yeah. when, when people knew we were doing Staten Island, they said you have to do Danino's here in Port Richmond. And they're absolutely right. This is so Staten Island because this place has been here since 1937, run by the same family. And back in the corner, right? are two women, eight, 91 and 88, and they're part of the family. And they're still at the desk at night taking names. Sure. And when you finish at the Nino's, you go across the street, right. and you have dessert at Ralph's. Ralph's Isis. Okay. Been here since 1928. Same spot, same family. Now, it's interesting that these two places date back to before World War II. Where did they set up shop? but in the Port Richmond area of Staten Island. It's right there at the foot of the Bayonne Bridge. It was the downtown of Staten Island until the Verrazano opened up. Then the new population lived inland, new shopping malls. Port Richmond had the same problem all the old downtowns did. Now you have a Mexican population opening Mexican stores there on Port Richmond Avenue. So these areas are coming back. And rooted in places like this that help maintain the cohesiveness of this community. Right. It's, it's wonderful. And I'll, I'll stay cohesive around pizza any day. And you're doing a good job. Farm Colony, Seaview Hospital, now Rehabilitation Center. Where, where are we in the map? Well, we're right here, Seaview and Farm Colony, right on the backbone of Staten Island. Actually, we're on Toad Hill. And here is a drawing, a sketch of what this place looked like many decades ago. Well, 
Uh, we're in this building right here. Uh, some of these buildings have been demolished for the uh, geriatric center that now occupies the site. But some of these original buildings are here in decayed state. And here we are. Tom Mateo um, is a doctor of education. He is the historian for the borough of Staten Island and a former director of the Seaview Hospital Rehabilitation Center. Tom, it's nice to have you with us. Hi. Tom, let's go back to the farm colony. What was the farm colony? The farm colony was actually the poorhouse for Staten Island. The very first poorhouse in New York City was built on the site of City Hall. Now, Staten Island's development was no different. The only real difference was Staten Island was the first one to have work there. So the people who lived there worked there to help sustain themselves. It was a real, live, operating farm. For how long? It started in the 1800s, and it lasted until the 1960s, although wow. the working of it as a farm stopped uh, just before the Depression. Now, go back to Seaview Hospital. When was Seaview created and why? Uh, tuberculosis was killing 10,000 New Yorkers a year. It was called consumption, the white plague. This is the only second sanitarium built specifically for tuberculosis in the entire country. The construction started here about 1908 and continued as the population grew through 1938. And at one time, they had over 2,000 patients. And all the services they needed, laundry, bakery, kitchen, everything they needed. How successful was this place in helping the patients? Well, as you know, the very first cure that people believed was going to work for TB was fresh air and sunlight. And that's why they picked this place. It's on top of a hill, one of the highest points on the eastern seaboard. It was designed to maximize airflow and sunlight. We are standing in the ward. And the way this was constructed, on both sides, we have porches so that all the residents could be outdoor at the same time, getting fresh air and sunlight. What about the tiles that we noticed on the top yeah. floor? Actually, we have tiles around the building, but specifically around the top, just under the eave, are some gorgeous Delft tiles made in Holland of scenes of nurses, doctors, children. In fact, all eight buildings had those tiles up there. Around 1950s, Dr. Robachek and his colleagues started playing around with a chemical that was made at Rutgers University, but they didn't know what the mixture was. So rather than wait for clinical trials, they decided too many people are dying, and they went forward with experiments right here. Criticized probably for that. Absolutely. But they feel that they saved two to three million lives by not waiting for the clinical trials to be over. So they found the cure actually around 1956, 1957. And the last patient left in, I think, 1973. And people were leaving here in droves. It was just like a miracle cure. We are basically in the middle of Staten Island on Toad Hill. Moravian Cemetery is the largest cemetery on Staten Island. It contains approximately 200,000 burials, and it is a non-sectarian cemetery. The cemetery is 114 acres. It contains two freshwater lakes. In 1776, there was 20,000 British troops stationed here on Staten Island. They needed water, so they came here to the Moravian Pond. One of the oldest gravestones is of Colonel Nicholas Britton, who passed in 1740. Our second oldest stone is of Rachel, the first wife of Thomas Dungan, who was the son of Thomas Dungan, who was the first colonial governor of the New York State. We also have the first Vanderbilt mausoleum that was built in 1865. I'd like to visit George Parker. He died in the Civil War. He has a unique white bronze monument. They call it white bronze. The name sounds more appealing because it's actually made of zinc. Well, I believe in promoting local history, and this is my way of keeping history alive by telling our residents real life stories.
For some 200 years, uh, Richmond Town, where we are now, was the center of government and commercial life here on Staten Island. Well, in 1898, when Staten Island became part of New York City, the decision was made, move the center of government and commercial life up to the northeast corner of the island. And this, Richmond Town, was essentially deserted. What do you do with a deserted town? Well, I think in a city where anything that's five minutes old is considered too old and knocked down, I think we need to preserve this and show people how we lived 200 years ago, 100 years ago, and that's what they're doing in Richmond Town today. Well, why is Richmond Town where it is? You see from this old map, it's in the geographic center of Staten Island where everybody could access it easily. It straddled two of the main roads crisscrossing the island. You can still see these roads in maps today. By the 1890s, commercial activity is moving up to Port Richmond on the Kilvan Cole, right opposite Bayonne. Do you remember Doninos? Sure. Well, th right that was Port of, Richmond. Yeah, sure. And then, as you said, in 1898, the Manhattan-centric city hall decided to take Borough Hall out of Richmond Town. The, this was the county center. And we would have to say George. Well, that killed Richmond Town. I mean, after 1898, this place became practically deserted. But in the 1930s, volunteers from the Staten Island Historical Society come in and they start to try to restore some of the, t uh, some of the buildings in the town. They start with, in the 1930s, the Four Lasers House, which we'll see in a moment, the 1837 Courthouse, which is right in back of us, the 1848 County Clerk's Office, which is just across the street. By the 1960s, they move 11 old buildings here to Richmond Town that would have been demolished if they hadn't been moved. From other parts of the island. That's right. That's right. And today there are 27 buildings in total. 15 of those buildings have been restored. So you can really come here and experience essentially a living history in right. about 300 years. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And what's even more amazing, you know, Europeans, not New Yorkers, but Europeans come here. Right. And the reason is the house we're going to see next, the Four Lasers house from 1695. Four Laser, what does that mean? The Four Laser was in the Dutch Reformed Church. He was a lay minister and a teacher. Four Laser, he's the man who stands in front of the congregation or the students and reads to them Dutch Four Laser. Well, this house was built around 1695, maybe 1696. It wasn't just a house. It was a school, it was a church on Sunday, and it was where the Four Laser lived. Uh, he lived in the room in back of us. It's a single room with all the furniture pushed up against the walls. So, so he could use it for other stuff. That's right? absolutely right. And there's a, a second assembly room upstairs, and there's a kitchen in the basement underneath us. Fireplace here, too, though. Oh, of course, because this a fireplace would be the main source of heat. So what's the design of this building that tells you what it is? Well, for one thing, it's a very simple wood frame building with plaster walls, exposed beam ceiling. By the way, Dutch elements include the double door, you close the bottom door to keep out the animals, the goats, etc., but open the top for yeah. air, you yeah. know? But what I find fascinating are the Dutch-style casement windows. The Dutch use casement windows, that means a window set in a case that you open up like a shutter. These look really old. Well, the, with the glass they might look old, but they aren't. This house underwent restoration beginning in the 1930s by historic Richmond Town, but in the 1980s, further restoration they put back these Dutch-style 17th century windows, and for that purpose, they used a blacksmith just down the road, and he's still in operation today. Can you imagine a blacksmith in New York City in the 21st century? That's so Staten Island. We'll return to a walk around Staten Island with David Hartman and historian Barry Lewis after this short break. And hello again, I'm Tom Stewart, and welcome back to 13. This is your opportunity to call and tell us just how much you're enjoying our walk around Staten Island, and that you're ready to support 13 with your personal contribution. And we hope you're on your way to your phone right now to do just that. Hello, I'm Kathy Ryan, and with me are Barry Lewis, our guide on our walking tours around New York, and Camilla Hanks, the executive director of the Downtown Staten Island Council. And if anyone knows Staten Island, it's Camilla. Welcome back to you both. Thank you. Camilla, you love Staten Island. Mm -hmm. I've just met your children. They're beautiful kids. <laughs> Please you. tell us what is so special for you about Staten Island. Yeah. Um, 
Staten Island is a great place to, to live, work, and play. And, you know, walking distance from the ferry, you'll find beautiful Victorians, you know, um, beautiful apartment rentals, and it's still some of the cheapest property that you can get in New York City. And it's a great place, and I think a lot of people don't understand how wonderful it is to live there, especially in the downtown area. And what is the community like? It seems so vibrant in the walking tour. Mm -hmm. Is it a very connected community? It is community? very connected. It's diverse. It's, you know, all kinds of groups. And, you know, Staten Island are great folks, you know, and we love each other. And it's, you know, a great community. Well, can you talk to those great folks and tell them to get to the phone and vote for this show on <laughs> Staten Island? <laughs> yes, if you're a Staten Islander, definitely get on the phone and support Channel 13 and support your borough. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Thank Camilla. You. And now it's your turn to tell us how much you're enjoying our walk around Staten Island. Make your call now at 1-800-272-1313 or visit 13.org with your contribution and your show of support for more programs like Barry's annual television tours around the city. Again, the amount you give is strictly up to you, but we've got lots of special rewards when you dig deep and make a generous contribution. And for those rewards, let's go back to Tom Stewart. Thanks, Kathy. And here's how we'll thank you when you support 13 and the programs describing New York's rich history, important architecture, and fascinating personalities. And our Staten Island walking tour is certainly rich in all of that. If you're getting a kick out of our walk around Staten Island, then call us at 1-800-272-1313 or log on to our website at 13.org and contribute $60 to show your approval. Our thanks for your contribution will be Thomas Mateo's wonderful book called Staten Island, New York. Here's the full Staten Island story, from its discovery in 1524 right up to the present. Tom Mateo gives a full account of the personalities who made Staten Island their home and literary inspiration. We're talking about people as well-known and as diverse as Longfellow, Thoreau, Emerson, Vanderbilt, Trump, Goodyear, Garibaldi, Santa Ana, and Maxim Gorky. That's quite a cross-section of characters. Or make a contribution of $75, and we'll send you the DVD of our Walk Around Staten Island, the latest in 13's popular and informative walking tour series. When you contribute $150, we'll show you our thanks by sending you the Walk Around Staten Island DVD, Mateo's History of the Island, and 13's Metro Umbrella 2. And finally, when you support 13 with a generous contribution of $350, we'll send you a collection of eight of our walking tours. In this collection, Barry and David take us through Harlem, Central Park, up Broadway, through Greenwich Village, around Brooklyn, through the Bronx and Queens, and finally, around Staten Island. There are a lot of choices, so call us at 1-800-272-1313 or go online to 13.org with the contribution that's right for you. And remember, too, that American Express will match your contribution, dollar for dollar, until we reach a total of $5,000 in viewer support. And also remember, it's okay for you to use a credit card if you'd like to charge your contribution. Now let's hear more from Kathy and Barry Lewis and Camilla Hanks. As Tom says, we've got lots of choices, so make your call now and contribute whatever you can. We're thrilled that Barry Lewis is with us and Camilla Hanks too, and I'm sure that nothing would please them more than knowing how much you respect 13 and now Staten Island as well. Well, from Maureen Seberg's Bridge Story to South sweet. Beach, oh, it was beautiful. I just, it was charming. To Danino's, eating pizza in Danino's. I'm getting to a point, I'm getting hungry, so let's, <laughs> let's get great. past Danino's because that happy was a wonderful land. I love the whole notion of happy <laughs> land. But Sea View was very compelling, the section on Sea View. Well, actually, I had never been to Sea View. I'd heard about it, but I'd never been there. Uh, Tom Mateo is an incredible man, and he is actually, he's more than just uh, husbanding an historic site. He is actually turning it into a cultural venue. They have a beautiful early 20th century theater. They just are restored, and a wonderful job doing that. Yes, it's amazing, Pamela. And they have also, they have a dance troupe on site. They have a theater on site. They do, people don't realize it is emerging into a cultural no? complex yes. for Staten Island. Mm -hmm. And everywhere I went, people said, oh yeah, Tom knows what he's doing. Yes, he does. Obviously, so. phenomenal. he knows exactly what he's doing. It sounds like you're going to need to do another show on Staten Island. I'd be happy to, yeah. but you have to give us some money. You know, <laughs> so th th that's the bottom line. But we, we hardly covered the neighborhoods because we didn't have time. So the next tour we do a Staten Island, we'll cover the neighborhoods because mm -hmm. Camilla knows there are amazing Victorian neighborhoods. People mm -hmm. would think that they had 
dropped down the well and yeah. woken up in 1860 or 1895. Yes, completely, not even totally restored, keeping exactly in the way that it was long ago. And there are the St. George Civic, you know, they take great care of those neighborhoods and they, they pride those neighborhoods in St. George and in Stapleton, which is now a historical landmark, which is like, um, in where I live, in my neighborhood. The Mud Lane Society. Yes, the Mud Lane Society. So you, you have a very deep well to draw from there. Mm -hmm. And Richmond Town, that segment, I, I, I now, found quite sad. <laughs> I think it's wonderful that they've rebuilt it, but the thought that it was this thriving town, the center of Staten Island, and then... Kathy, everything changes. Yes. I mean, look, there are great cities in Europe. The river dried up, and the city is now an archaeological site. Yes. Well, that's the same thing with Richmond Town. Luckily, it's still it's still in three dimensions. Well, what it made me think of was that what you en what you give your energy to thrives, and that's why we're here tonight mm -hmm. with this television show to say, give your energy now to Channel 13. Go to the phone, make mm -hmm. that call, because then we will thrive, and we can bring you more wonderful walking tours. Because I know you must have many, many more ideas. This is a big city, wonderful neighborhoods. We could spend two hours on so many of these neighborhoods. Please, I would love to do that. So just help us out, especially since American Express is matching us yes, tonight, right? tonight is the night. Again, let me remind you about our Walk Around Staten Island website. It's filled with stories, facts, images, maps, lots of things for you to do and see, even more than you've heard tonight. If you want to learn more about Staten Island, check out our website at 13.org. And now, back to Tom for one more look at the ways we'll thank you when you support 13 with a contribution. When you join us at our $60 level, you'll receive Thomas Mateo's book, Staten Island, New York. For a contribution of $75, we'll send you the DVD of our walking tour around Staten Island. When you contribute $150, we'll say thanks with the Walk Around Staten Island DVD, Tom Mateo's history book, and our 13 Metro Umbrella 2. And finally, when you make a generous contribution of $350, we'll send you a collection of walking tours, eight of them to be exact, from Harlem to Staten Island. So choose your thank you gift and then call us at 1-800-272-1313 or go online to 13.org with your contribution. And do keep in mind that American Express will double your contribution until we've reached $5,000 in viewer support. And remember, too, you may use any major credit card if you'd like to charge it to 13. Just have your card with you when you make your call. Now, once again, back to Kathy, Barry, and Camilla. Thank you, Tom. Some final thoughts from Camilla and Barry before we return to our walk around Staten Island. We were talking a bit about Seaview and Thomas Mateo. Can you, this book is one of our gifts to our viewers today when they call and pledge. Can you tell us a little more about the book? It looks like a gem. Well, you know, Tom is the official historian for Staten Island. And um, unlike Unlike a, a lot of local historians, actually Tom has a wonderful world view. And I think he's pulled that into the book. And he, he really just has a knack for, well, doing what he says he's going to do. And that's what people around the island and the cultural institutions have told me. And I think that it comes across in the book as well. Fantastic. And it's a $60 donation to 13. And you get a copy of that book of your very own. Now it's time to put on our walking shoes again and head for the streets, the boulevards, the parks, and the byways of historic Staten Island. We're about to see even more of Staten Island's hidden treasures. Who would have guessed how rich this island's legacy really is? And now it's become a part of 13's legacy, which of course has a richness of his own thanks to viewers like you. And if you called and made a contribution in the last few minutes and doubled its value thanks to our American Express Challenge, we do thank you very much. If you prefer, mail your check to 13, Box 1313, New York, New York, 10101. Major funding for a walk around Staten Island is made possible by Richmond County Savings Foundation and American Express. Two Staten Islands, as Maureen Seberg suggested, BBAB, before the bridge, after the bridge, after the bridge, with the explosion of development and building, the people who wanted to preserve the habitat of this place came out of the woodwork and allowed this green belt, it's called, to be a real thing and important here. 
and we're right in the middle of it on one of the highest points in the green belt. The irony of it is the entire green belt is natural except for the spot we're on. We are on what is colloquially called Mount Moses or Moses Mountain, and the reason it's so high Actually, we're standing on the debris from what Robert Moses hoped to be the Richmond Parkway. Is that why it's Moses? Because it was the That's Moses? right. That's why they call it Mount Moses, because he's the man who created it, like he created so much of New York City. Sure. Luckily, he didn't get his way with that parkway, and the green belt is still here for us to enjoy. Right. Adina Long is the administrator of the green belt, and it's nice to be on your mountain. Thank you. Cool. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, how difficult, how challenging, how tough was it? for all of you to not only maintain this place, but make sure it would be maintained for a long time? Um, it's extremely difficult. Um, the Parks Department uh, oversees about 2,000 acres of the Greenbelt, but all in all, it's nearly 3,000 acres. So there's both city, state, and private land that encompasses